I was just mentioning to the panel up here the last uh, major convention I was at two weeks ago in Atlanta, I was to introduce a speaker who didn't show up. <laughs> so I got to be the speaker. Um, I've also been in Kennedy recently where there were three PhDs and two astronauts trying to get a film projector working, and all it took five of them to get that. <laughs> uh, the panel has a consensus up here that we can go to the moon and we can't use overhead projectors and get microphones to work. I'm Helen Marie Hoffman. I'm with the National Science Teachers Association. I direct the uh, Space Science and Technology Division for that association. And thank you for your patience this morning. I think that when you hear from the panel, the, the wait certainly will have been worth it. In introducing um, quickly across the panel, we have Nichelle Nichols, Jules and Walt, myself, and Luann Bull Becker. And I will introduce them each in a little more uh, detail when we start to um, listen to their presentations. I'd like to have Michelle be the first speaker. And as you know, she is a singer, a very fine actress, with a lot of roles to her credit, Star Trek being one of them. And she probably needs no introduction to this group, as she's been a superb supporter for the National Space Society. Michelle. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, as you, most of you may already know, um, my field is in communication, so why am I here <laughs> in education? Well, you gotta, you've got to communicate to the young people the need for education. Um, I was uh, asked to come on the panel, and because I didn't really realize I was going to be in town, I wasn't able to accept until the last minute. So I really just um, don't have a speech to make. I'm going to be looking forward to joining in and talking about the various ways that we can make um, science and math number one um, by the year 2000. I think we can do it. It's a doable. Uh, I thought of them, made a few notes. And I thought, why? Why isn't math and science number one to begin with? Since it's so vital uh, to our lives, to our education, and certainly to our space program, to our future. And I think we've had, had a change since our Greek history, which we certainly developed our society on. We've lost our heroes. We don't have any heroes. I think what we must change is the method of hero worship. There really are two, only two types of heroes in the United States today. And that's in the entertainment field and in sports. I think we've got to stop putting a stigma on smart kids. I think we've got to, to find ways to elevate uh, a learning to a level in which young people can look forward to graduating, not just to get the heck out of school and get down to the local disco or to the local movie or to the local basketball game where their heroes are. I think we might want to, to begin by thinking about, about that, that the USA has adapted athletic heroes and entertainment heroes. And then why are those our souls? models for youngsters. There are no gold medals or Super Bowl rings 
uh, rings or Emmys or Oscars for scholars. And maybe that's something that we should start looking at. Ways of making that happen. I happen to think we ought to start with our teachers. I think we ought to start making, seeing how, talking about how that we can stimulate interest in young people to look on, on their, look at their teachers as heroes. I want to grow up and be just like my teacher. It used to be that way. In many parts of Europe, uh, intelligence and scholarship is highly prized. Um, maybe we can learn from the Oriental societies who, who hold intelligence and learning as a high premium. Why, those are the good guys. I think we need to change our method of hero worship. Perhaps there are many ways we'll be talking about that. Perhaps you have some ideas. But I remember going to school, and there would be always one teacher somewhere that I adored, who seemed to care, who I wanted to. T I went home and talked about that teacher, who's usually a her. I have one science teacher. It's a man, and he reminded me of of uh, Pickershaw, John Houston, um, John Houston. He was a crackly old guy, you know, and and he would come over to you just and he would practically pound on your desk and look at what your experiments were, and he'd, he'd provoke you, you know. He would make you exasperated. He would make you, make you wonder, make you not be satisfied, make you sure that you knew what you were doing. Are, are you sure that's right when he knew it was right? He would challenge you, and you'd have to fight him sometimes to, to establish that you, you know darn well you did it right. He was provoking minds. And then when you won the battle, when you won the battle of proving that you were right, you'd see him smile and walk away. Darn right is right. <laughs> and you would be so, so angry sometimes, but you'd be so proud. And kids would turn around and they'd look at you like, boy, she knows what she's doing, you know. And if you didn't know it, if you were wrong, it caused you to climb in there and really get it. Sometimes you go to another kid and you'd work on it together. And you'd come up to him and you'd say, Mr. Price, um, how about this? He was a hero to us. Even though he made us angry, we never forgot him. Never forgot him. I think maybe one of the ways that we could do it. <laughs> to stimulate young minds to want to grow up and be like their teachers. What about a national essay contest? <coughs> Could start regional, maybe Space Development Council or NSS could sponsor it, in which kids wrote why I think my teacher is number one. That'll set the fire under some of those teachers. 
There's nothing like better than a little healthy competition. I think we need to find heroes. New kinds of heroes. I hope we'll talk about some of those. I hope you have some ideas and some ways to go. And perhaps other ways of stimulating young minds to want to be part of being number one in math and science. And we want to start here too. Let schools and teachers know how important 
technical skills are. The U.S. Census has stated that by the year 2000, 70% of the U.S. population will be functionally illiterate and consequently unemployable. This is scary. You know, we were once the preeminent country for products. Our products dominated the world. Now, the United States still leads in innovation and economy, but other countries are taking the ideas and they're applying that to innovations of their own and to products that are commanding the dollars in the world market. So unless reforms in our educational process are undertaken, we're going to be trampled globally. Well, now, where do we start? We start, one, as I said before, by getting those teachers involved. At this conference, there are so many beautiful posters and pictures. I know you probably take those home. You may put them up in your office, or you may put them up at home. Go over to a school. Go talk to a teacher. One little poster will light that teacher's eyes. And when she goes in the classroom, or he goes into the classroom, the children will light up. If you don't believe me, go to a shopping center. You see a lady pushing a baby in a little carriage, and an airplane goes overhead. And that baby looks up to the sky. It starts from when we're little tiny babies. We wonder what's out there. From aviation, which of course are the first steps into space. Share those materials. Talk to those teachers. That's the only way that we can get to be number one by our goal year. Now, I'm sure that around your house you have some models. I bet you do. I see some smiles on faces. Go share those at a school. Show those to children. Help those teachers in your community so that they can help push so that we can put the picture that we landed on the moon almost 21 years ago in the textbooks. Some of our textbooks say, someday we may explore Mars. Someday we may look at Jupiter. We have a long, long way to go. You can help those teachers to understand that if they happen to be teaching industrial arts, hey, that's an aerospace subject. Airplanes and spacecraft, that comes right into industrial arts. If they're studying about the economics of the government, well, who controls the planes generally and who controls the spacecraft? The economics, the math, the reading, the science, the spelling. How about some spelling words for your kids at school or your neighbor's kid? Fly, flown, flu? Great spelling words. Take pictures of the astronauts or the mission specialists or many missions into space. Kid can't read? Put those pictures up on a window in the classroom. Let the youngster trace the spacecraft or trace the words. Booster? Rocket? Those are pretty big words for little kids in school. Why not start teaching them, uh, teaching them those words? We do have a few schools that are into aerospace and trying to get the message across to their kids. Last week I was in Portland, Oregon. I traveled the whole western half of the United States. And last week was Aerospace Week in the state of Oregon. And one school had taken bisqueen, a lot of bisqueen, a lot of duct tape, one fan, and they had built a classroom in space. Taped it all together, stuck the fan on one end, 
blown it up. One of the parents had gotten some painter overalls, the smallest size they could buy for these little fourth graders. The teacher rolled up the hems. Somebody else donated some big white stocking caps. And these kids lived in that bubble classroom for four hours a day. They could only communicate with a walkie-talkie. They had water. They had a sleep restraint, AKA is a sleeping bag. They even had a tarantula in a cage, which scared the devil out of me when I crawled into that thing and came upon a tarantula. They had space books. They ate space food. You have never seen a thousand children in that one school so turned on. And when they needed the necessary room, they had a little placard they hung around their neck and it said EVA. <laughs> <laughs> they would crawl out of the bubble and walk down the hallway, not saying a word to anyone because of course they were out in space. Use the necessary room and come back take off the EBA sign and pass it on to someone else. When they got ready to land, of course, the landing, all was done with the walkie-talkies. And as each astronaut and mission specialist came out of that bubble classroom, the rest of the students applauded. And it was one of the most exciting things I've ever seen, because that was aerospace in action. That same school has taken the measurements of the space shuttle and painted it onto their schoolyard. And so the children can walk on top of the outline of the space shuttle and get the feeling. Another school bought cheap old PVC pipe, hooked it together, the same size as the inside of the space shuttle and then had all the kids cram in there, 30 kids at a time. And then they say, oh, wait a minute. We need the bathroom. So down comes a piece of cardboard the size of the bathroom, if you kids have to leave. We need the sleeping area and so on. And pretty soon there were only about eight children in that model. Now that's action. Kids learn by experience. And the children in school today are going into the 21st century and be in competition with the rest of the world. Now, I hope I've tweaked your mind with a little thought, even if it's just buying PVC pipe, or giving a teacher some visqueen, or going into a classroom with some kind of a presentation about your aerospace specialty. The teacher that was so turned on in the bubble classroom, came to a program a long time ago, about 10 years ago, and she said, I'm tired of teaching. There's no turn on for me. It's the same old boring thing. I think I need to get out of the educational world. And I said, I've got just a thing for you. Some educational materials, a lot of resources, National Space Society, NASA, FAA, Challenger Center, people like Michelle, who came up and helped me do a program in Sacramento one time. And off the record, I tell you, she can drink more wine than I can. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I don't know how we put on that teacher workshop that next morning for 100 people. Just a spark to help those kids. Just one spark to help those teachers. And by golly, American ingenuity and American push, we will be number one in math and science for the year 2000. I picked up a poster. And you know, some people are auditory learners and some are visual learners. And if you don't remember anything that any of us said today, 
Remember the ultimate sandbox. Thank you. Our next panelist is Luann Bull Becker. She's an assistant to the president of the Challenger Center, which is a not for profit educational organization. In this capacity, she works on a variety of special projects, primarily in communications, and including, she's the editor of the Challenger Log, which is the Challenger Center's national newsletter. She developed the Challenger Center's first set of teacher workshop materials and teleconference curriculum materials. Prior to being at the Challenger Center, Luann spent 12 years in private industry as a computer systems specialist, and an educational designer and freelance writer. Good morning. Last Tuesday, I attended an education summit where the keynote speaker was Albert Shanker, president of the American Federation of Teachers. He was also responding to this challenge that President Bush has given to us. And he said that while many people liken it to President Kennedy's challenge at the turn of the decade, 1960, that perhaps it would be more appropriate to liken it to President George Washington issuing that same challenge, that we would send a man to the moon and do it within a decade. I think that's pretty pessimistic. The point he was making that when President Kennedy issued his challenge, there were already a number of systems in place. We were on our way to that goal. And he was questioning how many of the systems we already have in place in education. I hope we do not have 200 years to wait to reach that goal, and I don't think that's true. The question, though, more important than is this goal doable? Is, is it valuable? And to that, I think we would all say a resounding yes. The point what President Bush has done here is focused attention given this issue the priority it needs if we are going to make the kind of significant improvements that are needed to reach that goal. I will not give you the statistics. Um, you've heard some of them. We have atrocious dropout rates, um, disproportionate share of women and minorities in science and engineering. We need to reach out to the students that would not normally think of science as something to pursue. We need to reach the students that would never think of coming to this conference. Okay, it's valuable. So what I'd like to do in the rest of my time this morning is talk about some strategies um, that can help us get us to that goal, some of the key factors. And they all have to do with connections. The first connection being network building. President Bush has also been quoted as saying, every problem in America is being solved somewhere. In individual schools, in individual families, in individual communities, the problem is being solved. Children are excelling. They are being number one in math and science. But those are pockets of brilliance. The school we talked about here, that's not enough to reach this goal. Okay, we have to take it farther than that. President Bush also speaks about the thousand points of light. That's a wonderful visual. You know, light it to the stars and the heavens. And I say, let's tinker with that visual a bit. Rather than just seeing those thousand points of light, we need to see constellations. We need to see the links between them. Okay? One organization will not do it. One excellent video program or booklet or pamphlet by itself is not going to make the difference. We've got to do it together. Um, in Challenger Center literature, we, we often say, we don't have the answer, but we have a number of great partners like organizations represented up here on this panel that can help find the answer. That's what's going to do it. Um, and we need to reach out beyond space science education organizations. We need to reach beyond the educational community. Um, I don't know how many of you saw it. Uh, Fortune, spring 1990 special issue, Saving Our Schools. And the subtitle is, here's how business leaders, parents, teachers and communities are starting to fix American education. Excuse me. That's what it's going to take. That kind of network. First connection. Second connection, we need to link into mainstream education. I think we've had a number of excellent 
programs and materials that we put out, our perspective is space. That's, that's our love, and that's where we come at it. But think about the teacher in the classroom, again, the teachers that are not here today. To use those materials takes an extra effort. They have to be extraordinarily motivated, or they have to do it as extracurricular activities. And extra is not going to make a difference. It's got to be in the classroom. In a small way, and I'm from Challenger Center, so an example of what I mean, we recently opened our third learning center down in Tampa at the Museum of Science and Industry. And we provide curriculum materials that students fly simulated space missions and they go through certain tasks. The museum staff and the teachers in the surrounding districts took those materials and each activity linked it to the state mandated curriculum objectives. So that now all the teachers going through that program know that this links with what they're supposed to be teaching. They don't have to make that extra effort. I mean, we all go to seminars and programs and we learn great things, but how much of that just sits on a shelf? We've got to connect into the classroom. Okay? That's number two. And the third connection that I think is the most critical has already been alluded to this morning, that we need to connect to the students. We need to reach what is meaningful to them. And we at Challenger Center, and I would guess that everyone up here would say that space is a key to that connection. Most of you would probably agree with that statement on face value, but I don't think the general public might. Um, I was at a meeting with a congressional aide where we were telling her about Challenger Center's educational programs. And while we were talking about that, she's talking about her constituents being um, poverty stricken, um, the problems with lead-based paints. You know, how can a child who comes into a classroom who's hungry, how are they going to listen to you? And I felt that when I left, she thought, I mean, this was our failure, um, she thought we were talking about two different topics. And I don't think so. I think we're talking about two sides of the same coin. There are problems, and maybe we have one small piece of the solution. Because what's going to take students beyond those problems, what's going to take everyone beyond those problems, is stepping out of their environment, stepping back for a moment, and getting a vision of what the future is, a vision, more importantly, a model. I mean, something realistic that they can see that this is the future, this is their future. And we think space can do that. I'd like to read a quote by um, Dick Methia, who is our director of education at Challenger Center. He was also one of the 10 finalists in the Teacher in Space competition, from which Kristen McAuliffe was chosen. He writes, space represents challenge. The pursuit of excellence at the most extreme limits of human endurance, at the forefront of scientific achievement and technological progress. If we fail to instill in our young people this renewed sense of adventure and challenge, then we lose part of what it means to be human. You know what that means. All of you, if you're here today, space is an avocation. If you're lucky enough, it's a vocation. And you can probably remember back to a point in your life that that's why you give the extra effort. That's why you chose this path. And what we need to do is provide that spark. Jill mentioned that. We need to provide that moment. Maybe it's an individual. Maybe it's an experience. And we, again, I think space, space is critical to doing that. Challenger Center is implementing that in its own way with learning centers, teacher workshops, teleconferences. We are trying to reach beyond the students that would normally be reached by these programs. And we're doing it in a hands-on way. Again, exactly what you heard about earlier. Teaching space or about science and math is not merely facts and figures. You, I know you all know this. Um, there's a Chinese proverb that says, I hear and I forget, so much for today's speech, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. We think that's critical. So it's those connections to summarize. We need to make the connections to lots of students, 
not just the ones we're connecting to now. We need to reach the part of them that dreams so that they will continue on their path. We need to connect to every teacher and administrator all across the country so that the programs we develop, the solutions we come up with, they are shaped by the classroom, they are used within the classroom, not just extracurricular, and then in the process they reshape the classroom. And third, that we connect to all the organizations that share our goals. We are not competitors. This is not a solo effort. This needs to be education, science, um, you know, space science, government, business, volunteers, individuals. It's going to take that much of an effort. So my ending thought that typifies our philosophy, something we'd like to pass on to all the students we touch, it also seems appropriate to advise all of us trying to make these goals a reality. The German poet and dramatist Goethe once said, what you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Unquote. We believe space can provide that magic spark that ignites students' dreams. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. If we're intending to um, go back into space in a permanent way, also, look at the directive given by our president, George Bush, for the year 2000 in science and math. And what we're talking about is scientific literacy for our population. That's a word, uh, scientific and literacy, these two words put together that have been bandied around for quite a while. In fact, they've become a part of curricula across the country. But what is it? What is scientific literacy? pretty generic terms. If you look into the dictionary, scientific tells you that it's systematic knowledge, literacy, able to read and write, having an education, the list goes on. All of these folks have told you and alluded to the science literacy crisis, even Newsweek has told us when it gets to that point, it must be an everyday household term, scientific literacy. However, a crisis is a turning point where you make a decision. I think we're not at a turning point. I think we're in a state. I think we're in a situation. And it's been that way for a while. Having a citizenry that is definitely lacking in scientific knowledge. It is not just test scores. Don't misunderstand the press. It is also misconceptions and misunderstandings of our children, our young adults, and our adults. 45% of the population, the entire population, know that the Earth revolves around the sun. Mind you, this includes Harvard graduates standing in their caps and gowns on graduation day being asked these questions. Now, <clears throat> this also proceeds all the way to fairly recently to the uh, pseudoscience uh, used in the White House not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> if we're looking at scientific literacy, I think we're looking for quality. So rather than say, what are we looking for, I'm going to say two things we are not looking for. We are not trying in education, and if we are, we're on the wrong focus totally. We should not be trying to teach all there is out there. This doubles, what, every nanosecond of knowledge? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's, that sounds like a good, good measurement here. If it's not doubling at that rate, it soon will be. So think about trying to teach kids everything they should know, which brings me to the second point. Well, what we should do is teach the basics. Well, that's worse yet. Let's teach the basics. Let's regress. Tell me who's going to decide what the basics are. You, me, 
maybe the textbook companies, they're doing a good job. <laughs> maybe it's our uh, science or education leaders or the parents. Um, for everyone, there's a different set of bases. Now, this is where I take the step into heresy. And my colleagues in education and in science cringe and say, oh God, there she goes again. I think that we might be looking at a system that says we should teach one major concept of which all concepts can be hung on, and that's systems. And I will quickly tell you, having lived in Virginia, that if we had a person, I used to say the he, but I no longer say that, the person who dumped Kipon into the James River didn't need to know about the chemical makeup of Kipon or the dynamics and flow of river systems. All they had to know was systems, that if you input something, you are going to affect that system and understand that concept. I challenge folks in other disciplines to tell me that everything is not science. That shakes up my English colleagues and that people and so forth and so on. We are not, don't misunderstand us, trying to become one of the basics in the curriculum. Science is the basic. Without it, we as individuals and as a human race will not survive. We will not understand food additives. We will not understand pollution. We will not understand our ecosystem of which we are a part of. Now, the other thing we should be teaching is one skill, how to. Now, under all of this, you know, comes all the math that these students need and all of the reading and all of the other skills. Jumping on, I want to know um, the answer to a question as to why are our leaders and all of the speakers today, speakers that you're hearing around the country, so concerned about the science crisis as they put it. I'll tell you that teachers in the classroom have been crying out in the wilderness for over two decades about the problems in the educational system. We are pointing at teachers sometimes too often, I think, and saying, look what you're not doing. When we ask them to teach science in 43 and a half minute lab periods, think about that, and get interrupted by PA systems and bells, and teach everything from shoe time to sex ed. Okay, that's fine. We want the schools to pick up our problems and do all of our paperwork and teach all of the pitfalls of life to our students. And we need to put enough staff on board to teach those things and not pile those onto teachers in elementary or biology teachers in the secondary system. And then turn around and say, you failed us. Our, our students are not passing tests. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's um, the concern that it's the Soviets again. And maybe here comes Sputnik, the third and the fourth, and oh, I'm, and Mir. I don't think so. I, I think that there are probably as many answers and numerous variations on the answers as each one of you sitting in this audience as to why we have the problem in math and science in the country. I will tell you one of them to add on to it before I put it all into one category of change. We've got a brain drain on ourselves, not on developing nations. We have done it right in this country. We have allowed the private sector. Now, mind you, I'm not pointing my finger at the teacher who left the high school to double his or her salary overnight because they have children who need medical assistance and, and they want to go to college and, and whatever and need to put food on the table for their families. We've allowed our private sector to rob us of our top science teachers. And if you're walking around the halls at this convention and you run into people who are in the field teaching, please tell them thank you for staying. We have a gap, just as we do in scientists and engineers, in science teaching and wall teaching. Where uh, yeah, the teacher in the middle ages has, has bailed out for the reasons just discussed. 
We have quality teachers who have stayed with us, but we have very few who are coming into the fields. A couple of years ago, the state of Wisconsin graduated one physics education major, and he did not go into teaching. Now, if we look at change and we talk about a multitude of problems as to why this is happening, it's not just one, one answer. It's multiplicative. You have to take all of these problems and put them together. When you look at our advanced industrial nation, the America that we've taken for granted for more than a generation really is changing, so I will put this all under change. Our society is changing just like all societies do. Change is inevitable. It is a system, concept, and science. More of our people are old. Now, those of you that have gone through teaching or raising children, you know that they did not come with an owner's manual. <laughs> and when you thought you had the first one figured out, the second one was different, and there was no owner's manual delivered with that one. Now, I am in a situation, as many of you are at this point, where taking care of our parents is the next step for the aging generation. And trust me, there is no owner's manual with this parent care either. We are fewer young. We are every day coming more from minority groups. Our industry is changing. We're not the world economic leader we once were. We're a competitor now with other nations. You and I know our education system is changing, and indeed it should. Our colleges and universities, however, are still the envy of the world, and they're becoming more dependent on the revenue from our international students and faculty, not unlike our medical community. Well, we do need to make some changes in our educational system. We've heard some of the suggestions up here today. If we wish to give our students this competitive edge back as they proceed. Some of the major changes we're going to have to think very seriously about is to accommodate <coughs> people who are going to appear by the percent of 85, 85% in the year 2000 of the new entrants into the nation's workforce are going to come from our minorities and women. And let me tell you, these are the groups that we have traditionally kept out of science. Now, do we know how to teach? Of course we do. We know how to teach science, we know how to teach it very well. We know that it's hands-on. We know that science is a verb. We know that students, just like each one of us that learned every life skill that we have picked up, we learned by failure. We learned by trying. We learned by using all of the scientific processes to get where we are in life, by observing, by measuring, by, by making hypotheses, and so on. It's a natural thing that happens. We know how to let students do this. We know that all of science is built on the shoulders of those who had failures before them. That makes failure a very positive word it did for us. We are individuals who are living and functioning. We need to give our students the same chance to do that. There are some materials in the back of the room from the National Science Teachers Association and, and our, our space programs that we have done. We are also putting together a new scope and sequence that deals with science. It calls for the elimination of tracking of students. This is not a new idea. It recommends that students have science every year in all of the fields, and I am very happy to say the very first discipline that is mentioned in this new scope and sequence is Earth and space science. Putting the word space in there is a quantum leap, interesting. <laughs> We are advocating, along with the AAAS, American Association of the Advancement of Science, to look at our students studying all types of science every year, not just usually a 10th grade getting one shot at biology kids. That's all you get. You get it this year, and you never get to revisit those concepts again on different levels of abstraction. We are, in fact, talking about spacing so that there is time for thinking about and learning just the way we do in life. Thank you very much. I think you've had good input from the panel. Have we passed our time limit on questions? I do apologize for that. All of us will be around.